Hi, I'm Josh. Uh, welcome to Medrigham Airfield Visitor Centre. I'm one of the Dakota engineers here, um, sat in KG651, which is an original Second World War aircraft uh, of 24 Squadron, which was VIP transport. She's now um, completely free to come and have a look around, sit in the cockpit, sit in a power seat. You can do anything you like in the aircraft. It's completely safe. <laughs> And you won't have to climb into the deck on this very precarious ladder. What is it, Josh? Uh, they're the original Second World War steps for the aircraft, so they've lived a life with her, basically. Anywhere she went, she had these steps with her. But don't worry, boys and girls. <laughs> you can use one of these passenger steps, which is... Uh, 100% safe. At the back of the aircraft, where it's got uh, an 88 foot wingspan, which you can see quite well from the back, as well as its full metal construction, except for the control surfaces, which is canvas. Uh, the aircraft's currently painted in the colours of 271 Squadron, which um, were an RAF squadron that um, the pilot won a VC, so the Glider Trust thought it was appropriate. Excuse me, I think I can hear a, a, a <laughs> Lancaster passing over. <laughs> Do you ever get visits from the air crews? Yes, quite often actually. Uh, the BBMF, every time they're up, because they're only about two miles away, every time they've got an aircraft up, they'll fly over. Um, so it's, it's quite a normal um, sound. That could be an easy jet. <laughs> I think it's an A400. <laughs> well done. Um, but yeah, so it's currently painted in an RAF scheme, which you can see uh, the bars at the back signify RAF, same with the roundel. The serial number KG651 is still visible. Um, what does it mean, KG651? Is it like a number plate? Uh, yeah, basically, it's the um, it's the number the RAF give to every aircraft. Well, it's identification number that they give to every aircraft. So um, it had four in its lifetime. It had KG651, SUAZI, uh, BSZSW, and GAMHJ. Um, so it's just, depending on what country it belongs to, depends on the serial number. Um, but yeah, you can see currently we've got quite a lot of work on with the aircraft. You can see the shiny metal end of the trailing edge, which uh, when it was delivered here by lorry, they managed to uh, hit a lamppost, which caused extensive damage all the way down the back of the aircraft, uh, which we're just now in process of repairing. Now we're finally inside. Um, you can also see... So tell me more, where did, where was she based, where did she come from to be put on the lorry and hit a lamppost? So um, when she was at North Weald, the company that owned her there weren't very good at um, funding their exuberant lifestyle with the aircraft, so they um, had to sell her very quickly. So they sold her for next to nothing and had to move her within 24 hours, otherwise it was getting scrapped which um, we gave it a home pretty much instantly. And then because of that, they took bolt croppers and angle grinders to everything. So she arrived on four lorries. Um, the main, well, the wings were put on one. The main center section of the aircraft with the engines were on another. The main fuselage and then one full of parts. Um, and yeah, as it was driving through uh, Sleaford, it hit a concrete lamppost and um, destroyed the entire back of the trailing edge as well as um, at the flap that was still on. Um, so she couldn't fly again anyway? No. In theory, you could, but it would take um, a couple of million because um, you'd need to rewire the entire aircraft as well as uh, fix a couple of small problems they have. So what's your little artefacts that you've got here? So uh, this is currently part of our propeller change scene, which you've got a small... Um, RAF standard issue air compressor, which you can see the little dummy over there is uh, pumping up the tyres as well. Then next to it, which is by far one of the rarest things in the aircraft, is the track recovery trailer. They used to use these when landing gear collapsed on aircraft and they used to um, push them underneath uh, aircraft and then tow it out with a tractor. Uh, we found this in a barn. Yes, uh, on the airfield and uh, we brought it back here and have completely refurbished it. Um, it must have been a eureka moment. It was, um, it was definitely a different one. It wasn't anything that anyone expected and no one really knew what it was until we started researching it. And then 
We've not actually found any more examples of them looking like that. We found later ones where they were used to do um, jets. But we've also got uh, then a picture of a crash Lancaster from here uh, with three of these under them to pull it back to the airfield. Um, the propeller on top uh, is actually quite a famous propeller. It's from uh, a CASA, um, a CASA, which is a Spanish company that used to build Heinkel 111s. So in the Battle of Britain movie, both these props are on a CASA uh, pretending to be a German. Uh, both the props came from Kent, as the museum there uh, are trying to put theirs back to uh, German. So American props on a German aircraft weren't very fitting. So they've um, given us the props and then had new ones for them made. Uh, so yeah, you can see the dummy down here with his pencil on his um, the little probe you can see is the end of the air compressor, which the air compressor actually runs, so it's a running artefact. Um, but yeah, then you can see the engine of the aircraft as well, which we've got exposed. On purpose? Uh, yes, it's part of, because we had to do something, because before the beginning of the year we didn't have props, so we had to try and make some form of interest and reason why you wouldn't have propellers on, and that was the whole changing scene. So we've got a new engine arriving, well, new. It's a uh, training aid engine that the Battle of Britain Memorial flight we're using. That's arriving in two weeks, which will then be the ending part of this change scene because it'll be the engines being changed, not the propeller. Um, but yeah, that's about it for, oh. Then the two boards out here are just histories of Dakotas in general. Um, this side of the aircraft, you can see the emergency exit, which is in the probably worst spot for any emergency exit, because if you open the door with the prop in the wrong place, you hit the prop. So we think the only way you'd ever use that emergency exit is if you were, uh, had hit the water and your props had bent back. Um, but yeah, I mean... And have stopped turning. Yeah, hopefully. Even if, uh, because of the force of the water, it'd be like hitting concrete, so the props would have broken anyway. So it would have um, allowed even a couple more feet to try and get you out the door. Has this worked as a magnet for tourists? Because without it, it's, how can I put it, just another X Absolutely. RAF bomber yeah. airfield. It's, it's one of the only ones we know where you can sit in the pilot seat. So it's different because you can get all the way up to the controls. You can play with the controls. You can flip the switches. You can be a big kid. That's what we find mostly. It's people that love aircraft and love Dakotas, have seen them fly and never been in them. Whereas here you can get in them, you can sit where paratroopers sit, you can sit in the pilot seat or the navigator and feel some form of connection with people that you can't get anywhere else. Um, How much is she worth? Priceless might be um, a good term? Not as much as you'd think. You can buy Dakotas still for 350000 and because... So many were made. Yeah, and because she can't fly again, it, it, it's probably half that at most, um, especially with all the work that's still going on with her. Even with, I mean, we've got a vast amount of history on her, it still doesn't really account for the fact she's not flying. But she's a rare bird because, <clears throat> uniquely perhaps, you can sit in the captain's, in the skipper's seat. Yeah. That's what's the, um, what do they call it when they're selling something? Unique selling point, yeah. USP. It's absolutely. I mean, the museum website. It, you can't do that in the Imperial War. No, well, you can't do you it can't at do Duxford, it. I don't think. No, you can't. You have to have a very special day to get in cockpits pretty much anywhere, to be honest, even somewhere like Newark. So why are you allowing the public willy-nilly to come and sit up there? For an experience, basically. It's something that, because she can't fly, because she's had her controls cut, all of her electrics cut, you can't do any damage up there. It's more just the experience of being in a Second World War aircraft with Second World War fittings, being able to do whatever you like. How exciting is it to be a volunteer engineer at Metheringham? Oh, incredibly. I mean, it's an ever-evolving museum. We've got, yeah, promises of tiger moths, jeeps, the aircraft itself. 
even down to the Jet Provost around the corner, which still fires up and runs every month. And talk about our links with America. You plan to do something American revolutionary with this aircraft. It's decked out in RAF colours at the moment. Uh, and it's going to be painted by the end of the year with American half on this side to signify the um, numerous amount of American aircraft that flew into here with casualties. So you'll have your American roundel on the side and on the wings, as well as invasion stripes, as the aircraft that flew into here were all after the invasion of Normandy. So they were flying in every other week full of American uh, casualties to, fly, to drive it to Notton Hall. So this side will be you, Saf? Yes. You've worked it out the left-hand side? Yes. And the other side? Will remain as KG651 in her green colours um, with the red propeller spinners, which identifies as 24 Squadron during the war. Presumably, all your researchers are desperately deciding what serial number you're going to have on the side for the USAF Dakota. Um, Something that came in here? Can you find from records? We have all the records of all the aircraft that flew into here with the Americans. Currently, though, we're actually offering any person with an American connection to Dakotas as a whole can sponsor half the aircraft and they can have it painted in whatever serial number, whatever nose are, as long as it stays green basically, you can do whatever you like with it. Um, Bit got, of sponsorship I feel. Yeah, um, it's got two plans, so it's either it will be painted in the colours of RAF uh, Barkston Heath because that was the main airfield that flew into here or whatever someone donates that they want the aircraft to be. So, come to Metheringham. So yeah, come to Metheringham and enjoy something a bit different. <laughs> and you don't have to just look, you can sit on the pilot seat or a parachutist seat. Apart from the... Apart from the stretches, you can sit wherever you like, do whatever you like. The aircraft will react as if it was still functioning, uh, even though it's not and it's completely safe to do whatever you like in. <laughs> We're now in the main fuselage of the aircraft, which has your casualty evacuation on one side, which uh, links to RAF Metheringham, and your paratrooper on the other, as that's one of the most famous roles Dakotas were involved with. As well as the small detail that you don't really are able to notice from everything else, which is the floor section being able to uh, lash um, jeeps, guns, crates, anything basically to the inside of the aircraft. Um, so we'll start with the casualty evacuation side because that's the most important side for the aircraft. So you were able to carry 24 stretchers and four nurses. Uh, these guys flew into here from D-Day onwards uh, from airfields such as RAF Barkston Heath, RAF Fulbeck um, and RAF North Witham, uh, full of Americans that used to fly into here to drive up to Notton Hall. So all the stretchers you see are Second World War, the bottom two coming from the Red Cross at Sleaford and the upper well, upper six coming from an army surplus hangar, which uh, the Red Cross donated, and the top six, the top six are from uh, a U.S. Army surplus hangar. Um, all came with tags for the Second World War to prove uh, their all their authenticity. Um, the only modern part of this stretcher fit is the way they're connected. The only bits missing are some metal rods that go beneath the feet as a bit more of support for the patient. Um, the fabric coverings here are um, scary but authentic. We've got pictures of them hanging, um, well, have all your bodies in it with just these to hold them up. So you can imagine if the aircraft bumps, all of the stretches jump, all of them sway with the, um, with the aircraft. So it can include quite a bumpy ride. We're now moving on to paratroopers. You could carry 27 paratroopers in total and a loadmaster. The seats you see here are from Dakotas during the war. They've all got their original wartime tags on them still to prove that they are surplus from a C-47 uh, during late war periods. So it's got the date of 1945 on them. So it could have been involved in any of the jumping operations such as Market Garden and D-Day. Um, the eyelets you see at the back are where you used to lash yourself in as a form of seat belt. And, and the seats themselves have got the distinct bucket shapes because you were sat on your parachute 
and it was a way that you didn't then slide down the aircraft. Um, another small detail for the fuselage is the circular patches you see. They're from, due to the aircraft being a pollution control aircraft, the detergent hoses would sp uh, go out of these holes to vent the gases because the gases were very explosive in a very old aircraft and they figured out eventually that wasn't a good mix. You ended up with um, a lot of problems involved in the spraying of them and then the actual tanks rupturing. So this aircraft was one of the first two that Air Atlantique bought for that role. So it was this one and GAMPL, I believe, were the first two pollution control aircraft. It was only ever involved in two major oil spills, and this aircraft did five days solid work on that. Uh, but yeah, that's about it for the fuselage. We're not in a Lancaster. <laughs> what are we? Uh, we're in a 1944 C-47A, uh, which is KG-651, or GAMHJ, as she was in her civilian registrations. Um, yeah, she was built in April. By June, she was in Canada, and by June the, th uh, June the 13th, she arrived in Britain. Um, so, missed all the nice, well-known wartime stuff, so went into 24 Squadron, which was VIP transport, so she was completely silver and um, ferried absolutely anyone that was important around. She was a reserve aircraft. So she, Winston Churchill? Uh, it's not a no. Because it was an, a, a reserve uh, an aircraft, it could have flown absolutely anyone around. Uh, we haven't got the logbooks for it because it, um, it went to a rather dodgy company after the war who um, were quite good at, say, gun running. Um, <laughs> Are they still alive? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, it was Pan African Air Charter who were very well known for the formation of Israel and the uh, small war that happened after there. So uh, they destroyed all their logbooks of her, which. As you do? Yeah, to try and hide everything. Um, so we've only got logbooks from 1960 onwards. So um, we know she's got a total of about 45,000 flying hours, which for a Dakota is very few. But for something like, um, well, Lancaster. It's roughly the similar one to the, what the BBMF one's got, which is um, quite scary to think since she hasn't flown since 2000. Um, yeah. <laughs> so she's got a little history regarding Northfield Aerodrome. Yeah. So um, when she came out of service, she went to the Aerosault Glider Trust, who um, were based at RF Shawbury. When they went bust in 2015, she went to Northfield up until 2018 which is when she came here, because the company at Northfield also went bust. Um, but she was there with a company called Dakota Air, who were planning to get her flying, but uh, didn't manage to. So I'm sat in the navigator spot, which has uh, nearly all the equipment needed for a, a Second World War Dakota. It's got your uh, navigation computer, a small radar beacon, uh, the box for the Astra Compass, which is currently in the Astra Dome, and a drift indicator behind me which measures drift from a selected point on a map. Uh, move out of the way for you. Uh, the map on the desk is from uh, the Vulcan it used to fly, as the navigator from that uh, actually volunteers here. Uh, so above it as well, you've got the drinking water for the entire aircraft, as well as a fan to blow cold air around the aircraft while it's in the air. I'm now sat in the radio operator's desk, which includes all of its Second World War fittings from the Morse key, uh, the intercom system, and then the array of radio boxes. I can't see the Morse key. Where is that? Then? It's here. Is it movable? Could yes. you give us? Could you give us SOS? There you go. Right, <laughs> we'll all come running. <laughs> so tell us about the other gear. Uh, so it's selection of radio boxes. Some are British, some are American. It's designed to be that way because of its role as VIP transport. It uh, it shortened the time between journeys. So you could be flying into an American-owned airfield or a British, and it just meant you didn't have to strip out all the radio equipment to put it back in again for your next flight. So there's uh, a grand total of seven of these little signal boxes at the, bot um, at the bottom around the aircraft, uh, which have four channels each, which for a Second World War aircraft is a lot. For modern-day standards, it's absolutely nothing. Um, both this position and the navigator's position was removed in the 60s uh, because they were able to do it all from the front cockpit. Uh, and that's about it for this station, actually.
Okay, let's go up to the uh, sharp end. We're now sat in the cockpit, which is um, almost put back to its Second World War fittings, including an original instrument panel with few minor modifications made for its later life. So, for example, the gyro compass and the artificial horizon don't quite fit because the computer screen they put in to replace them after the navigator and radio operator were removed uh, was a few millimetres bigger than the instruments, so they just cut the hole bigger. So we've um, managed to get it so it almost fits perfectly. So, the instruments are mirrored on both sides with pilot on the left, co-pilot on the right. Uh, which includes joint controls on both sides. So this is also the same with the rudder. Ooh. And the tow brakes which are on top of the rudder, which is for um, braking while on the ground. Uh, in the centre you've got the centre console, which your white is your propeller pitch, your black is your throttle, and your red is your fuel mixture. Everything's independently controlled, say if you've got an engine fire or something. Um, everything's mirrored in the cockpit, so if someone needed the toilet or got shot, um, you were able to just take over instantly, which is different to a Lancaster where you had to drag the guy out, basically, so you could take over. Uh, the Americans thought of that and added a second person. Um, but yeah, the, the fitting now is almost identical how it had been in the war, including the compass in the centre. Um, and all the soundproofing you can see around you. Um, yeah, that's about it for this part.